With the assistance of libmind.com, you can translate ebooks into your native language, build your own online library, save them forever, and customize audiobooks at an affordable price. About Carnegie, Dale Breckenridge Carnegie, originally Carnegie until 1922 and possibly somewhat later, November 24, 1888 to November 1, 1955, was an American writer and lecturer and a developer of famous courses in self-improvement, salesmanship, corporate training, public speaking, and interpersonal skills. Born in poverty on a farm in Missouri, he was the author of How to Win Friends and Influence People, first published in 1936, a massive bestseller that remains popular today. He also wrote a biography of Abraham Lincoln, titled Lincoln the Unknown, as well as several other books. Carnegie was an early proponent of what is now called responsibility assumption, although this only appears minutely in his written work. One of the core ideas in his books is that it is possible to change other people's behavior by changing one's reaction to them. Things to think of first, a f o r e w o r d. The efficiency of a book is like that of a man, in one important respect, its attitude toward its subject is the first source of its power. A book may be full of good ideas well expressed, but if its writer views his subject from the wrong angle even his excellent advice may prove to be ineffective, this book stands or falls by its author's attitude toward its subject. If the best way to teach oneself or others to speak effectively in public is to fill the mind with rules, and to set up fixed standards for the interpretation of thought, the utterance of language, the making of gestures, and all the rest, then this book will be limited in value to such stray ideas throughout its pages as may prove helpful to the reader, as an effort to enforce a group of principles it must be reckoned a failure, because it is then untrue. it is of some importance, therefore, too. Those who take up this volume with open mind that they should see clearly at the outstart what is the thought that at once underlies and is builded through this structure. In plain words it is this, training in public speaking is not a matter of externals, primarily. It is not a matter of imitation, fundamentally, it is not a matter of conformity to standards, at all. Public speaking is public utterance, public issuance, of the man himself, therefore the first thing both in time and in importance is that the man should be and think and feel things that are worthy of being given forth. Unless there be something of value within, no tricks of training can ever make of the talker anything more than a machine, albeit a highly perfected machine, for the delivery of other men's goods. So self-development is fundamental in our plan, the second principle lies close to the first, the man must enthrone his will to rule over his thought, his feelings, and all his physical powers, so that the outer self may give perfect, unhampered expression to the inner. It is futile, we assert, to lay down systems of rules for voice culture, intonation, gesture, and what not, unless these two principles of having something to say and making the will sovereign have at least begun to make themselves felt in the life. The third principle will, we surmise, arouse no dispute, no one can learn how to speak who does not first speak as best he can. That may seem like a vicious circle and statement, but it will bear examination, many teachers have begun with the how. Vain effort. It is an ancient truism that we learn to do by doing. The first thing for the beginner in public speaking is to speak, not to study voice and gesture and the rest. Once he has spoken he can improve himself by self-observation or according to the criticisms of those who hear, but how shall he be able to criticize himself? Simply by finding out three things, what are the qualities which by common consent go to make up an effective speaker, by what means at least some of these qualities may be acquired, and what wrong habits of speech in himself work against his acquiring and using the qualities which he finds to be good, experience, then, is not only the best teacher, but the first and the last. But experience must be a dual thing, the experience of others must be used to supplement, correct and justify our own experience, in this way we shall become our own best critics only after we have trained ourselves in self-knowledge, the knowledge of what other minds think, and in the ability to judge ourselves by the standards we have come to believe are right. If I ought, said Kant, I can. An examination of the contents of this volume will show how consistently these articles of faith have been declared, expounded, and illustrated. The student is urged to begin to speak at once of what he knows. Then he is given simple suggestions for self-control, with gradually increasing emphasis upon the power of the inner man over the outer. 
Next, the way to the rich storehouses of material is pointed out. And finally, all the while he is urged to speak, speak, speak as he is applying to his own methods, in his own personal way, the principles he has gathered from his own experience and observation and the recorded experiences of others to so now at the very first let it be as clear as light that methods are secondary matters, that the full mind, the warm heart, the dominant will are primary, and not only primary but paramount, for unless it be a full being that uses the methods it will be like dressing a wooden image in the clothes of a man. J. Bergessenwein.Narberth, PA, January 1, 1915. Sense never fails to give them that have it, words enough to make them understood. It too often happens in some conversations, as in apothecary shops, that those pots that are empty, or have things of small value in them, are as gaudily dressed as those that are full of precious drugs, they that soar too high, often fall hard making a low and level dwelling preferable. The tallest trees are most in the power of the winds, and ambitious men of the blasts of fortune. Buildings have need of a good foundation, that lies so much exposed to the weathered. William Penn Chapter 1 Acquiring confidence before an AUDIENCE There is a strange sensation often experienced in the presence of an audience. It may proceed from the gaze of the many eyes that turn upon the speaker especially if he permits himself to steadily return that gaze. Most speakers have been conscious of this in a nameless thrill, a real something, pervading the atmosphere, tangible, evanescent, indescribable. All writers have borne testimony to the power of a speaker's eye in impressing an audience. This influence which we are now considering is the reverse of that picture, the power their eyes may exert upon him, especially before he begins to speak, after the inward fires of oratory are fanned into flame the eyes of the audience lose all terror. William Pittenger, Extempore Speech, students of public speaking continually ask, how can I overcome self-consciousness and the fear that paralyzes me before an audience? Did you ever notice in looking from a train window that some horses feed near the track and never even pause to look up at the thundering cars, while just ahead at the next railroad crossing a farmer's wife will be nervously trying to quiet her scared horse as the train goes by? How would you cure a horse that is afraid of cars, graze him in a backwoods lot where he would never see steam engines or automobiles, or drive or pasture him where he would frequently see the machines, apply horse sense? To ridding yourself of self-consciousness and fear, face an audience as frequently as you can, and you will soon stop shying. You can never attain freedom from stage fright by reading a treatise. A book may give you excellent suggestions on how best to conduct yourself in the water, but sooner or later you must get wet, perhaps even strangle and be half scared to death. There are a great many wetless bathing suits worn at the seashore, but no one ever learns to swim in them. To plunge is the only way, practice, practice, practice in speaking before an audience will tend to remove all fear of audiences, just as practice in swimming will lead to confidence and facility in the water. You must learn to speak by speaking, the Apostle Paul tells us that every man must work out his own salvation. All we can do here is to offer you suggestions as to how best to prepare for your plunge. The real plunge no one can take for you. A doctor may prescribe but you must take the medicine. Do not be disheartened if at first you suffer from stage fright. Dan Patch was more susceptible to suffering than a superannuated dray horse would be. It never hurts a fool to appear before an audience, for his capacity is not a capacity for feeling. A blow that would kill a civilized man soon heals on a savage. The higher we go in the scale of life, the greater is the capacity for suffering, for one reason or another, some master speakers never entirely overcome stage fright, but it will pay you to spare no pains to conquer it. Daniel Webster failed in his first appearance and had to take his seat without finishing his speech because he was nervous. Gladstone was often troubled with self-consciousness in the beginning of an address. Beecher was always perturbed before talking in public, blacksmiths sometimes twist a rope tight around the nose of a horse, and by thus inflicting a little pain they distract his attention from the shoeing process. One way to get air out of a glass is to pour in water. Be absorbed by your subject apply the blacksmith's homely principle when you are speaking. If you feel deeply about your subject you will be able to think of little else. Concentration is a process of distraction from less important matters. It is too late to think about the cut of your coat when once you are upon the platform, so center your interest on what you are about to say, fill your mind with your speech material and, 
like the infilling water in the glass, it will drive out your unsubstantial fears. Self-consciousness is undue consciousness of self, and, for the purpose of delivery, self is secondary to your subject, not only in the opinion of the audience, but, if you are wise, in your own. To hold any other view is to regard yourself as an exhibit instead of as a messenger with a message worth delivering. Do you remember Albert Hubbard's tremendous little tract, A Message to Garcia? The youth subordinated himself to the message he bore. So must you. By all the determination you can muster. It is sheer egotism to fill your mind with thoughts of self when a greater thing is there, truth. Say this to yourself sternly, and shame your self-consciousness into quiescence. If the theater caught fire you could rush to the stage and shout directions to the audience without any self-consciousness, for the importance of what you were saying would drive all fear thoughts out of your mind, far worse than self-consciousness through fear of doing poorly is self-consciousness through assumption of doing well. The first sign of greatness is when a man does not attempt to look and act great. Before you can call yourself a man at all, Kipling assures us, you must not look too good nor talk too wise. Nothing advertises itself so thoroughly as conceit. One may be so full of self as to be empty. Voltaire said, we must conceal self-love. But that cannot be done. You know this to be true, for you have recognized overweening self-love in others. If you have it, others are seeing it in you. There are things in this world bigger than self, and in working for them self will be forgotten, or, what is better, remembered only so as to help us win toward higher things, have something to say the trouble with many speakers is that they go before an audience with their minds a blank. It is no wonder that nature, abhorring a vacuum, fills them with the nearest thing handy, which generally happens to be, I wonder if I am doing this right. How does my hair look? I know I shall fail. Their prophetic souls are sure to be right, IT is not enough to be absorbed by your subject, to acquire self-confidence you must have something in which to be confident. If you go before an audience without any preparation, or previous knowledge of your subject, you ought to be self-conscious, you ought to be ashamed to steal the time of your audience. Prepare yourself. Know what you are going to talk about, and, in general, how you are going to say it. Have the first few sentences worked out completely so that you may not be troubled in the beginning to find words. Know your subject better than your hearers know it. And you have nothing to fear, after preparing for success, expect it let your bearing be modestly confident, but most of all be modestly confident within. Overconfidence is bad, but to tolerate premonitions of failure is worse, for a bold man may win attention by his very bearing, while a rabbit-hearted coward invites disaster, humility is not the personal discount that we must offer in the presence of others, against this old interpretation there has been a most healthy modern reaction. True humility any man who thoroughly knows himself must feel, but it is not a humility that assumes a worm-like meekness, it is rather a strong, vibrant prayer for greater power for service, a prayer that Uriah Heep could never have uttered, Washington Irving once introduced Charles Dickens at a dinner given in the latter's honor. In the middle of his speech Irving hesitated, became embarrassed, and sat down awkwardly. Turning to a friend beside him he remarked, There, I told you I would fail, and I did. If you believe you will fail, there is no hope for you. You will, rid yourself of this I am a poor worm in the dust idea. You are a god, with infinite capabilities. All things are ready if the mind be so. The eagle looks the cloudless sun in the face, assume mastery over your audience in public speech, as in electricity, there is a positive and a negative force. Either you or your audience are going to possess the positive factor. If you assume it you can almost invariably make it yours. If you assume the negative you are sure to be negative. Assuming a virtue or a vice vitalizes it. Summon all your power of self-direction, and remember that though your audience is infinitely more important than you, the truth is more important than both of you, because it is eternal. If your mind falters in its leadership the sword will drop from your hands. Your assumption of being able to instruct or lead or inspire a multitude or even a small group of people may appall you as being colossal impudence, as indeed it may be. But having once essayed to speak, be courageous. Be a courageous, it lies within you to be what you will. Make yourself be calm and confident, reflect that your audience will not hurt you. 
If Beecher and Liverpool had spoken behind a wire screen he would have invited the audience to throw the overripe missiles with which they were loaded, but he was a man, confronted his hostile hearers fearlessly, and won them, I am facing your audience, pause a moment and look them over, a hundred chances to one they want you to succeed, for what man is so foolish as to spend his time, perhaps his money, in the hope that you will waste his investment by talking dully, concluding hints do not make. Haste to begin, haste shows lack of control. Do not apologize. It ought not to be necessary, and if it is, it will not help. Go straight ahead, take a deep breath, relax, and begin in a quiet conversational tone as though you were speaking to one large friend. You will not find it half so bad as you imagine, really, it is like taking a cold plunge, after you are in, the water is fine. In fact, having spoken a few times you will even anticipate the plunge with exhilaration. To stand before an audience and make them think your thoughts after you is one of the greatest pleasures you can ever know. Instead of fearing it, you ought to be as anxious as the foxhounds straining at their leashes, or the racehorses tugging at their reins. So cast out fear, for fear is cowardly when it is not mastered. The bravest know fear, but they do not yield to it. Face your audience pluckily, if your knees quake, make them stop. In your audience lies some victory for you and the cause you represent. Go win it. Suppose Charles Martel had been afraid to hammer the Saracen at Tours, suppose Columbus had feared to venture out into the unknown West, suppose our forefathers had been too timid to oppose the tyranny of George III, suppose that any man who ever did anything worth while had been a coward. The world owes its progress to the men who have dared. And you must dare to speak the effective word that is in your heart to speak, for often it requires courage to utter a single sentence. But remember that men erect no monuments and weave no laurels for those who fear to do what they can, is all this unsympathetic, do you say, man, what you need is not sympathy, but a push. No one doubts that temperament and nerves and illness and even praiseworthy modesty may, singly or combined, cause the speaker's cheek to blanch before an audience but neither can any one doubt that coddling will magnify this weakness. The victory lies in a fearless frame of mind. Professor Walter Dill Scott says, success or failure in business is caused more by mental attitude even than by mental capacity. Banish the fear attitude, acquire the confident attitude. And remember that the only way to acquire it is, to acquire it. I in this foundation chapter we have tried to strike the tone of much that is to follow. Many of these ideas will be amplified and enforced in a more specific way, but through all these chapters on an art which Mr. Gladstone believed to be more powerful than the public press, the note of justifiable self-confidence must sound again and again. Questions and exercises point 1. What is the cause of self-consciousness? 2. Why are animals free from it? 3. What is your observation regarding self-consciousness in children? 4. Why are you free from it under the stress of unusual excitement? 5. How does moderate excitement affect you? 6. What are the two fundamental requisites for the acquiring of self-confidence? Which is the more important? 7. What effect does confidence on the part of the speaker have on the audience? 8. Write out a two-minute speech on confidence and cowardice. 9. What effect do habits of thought have on confidence? In this connection read the chapter on right thinking and personality. 10. Write out very briefly any experience you may have had involving the teachings of this chapter. Point 11. Give a three-minute talk on stage fright, including a kindly imitation of two or more victims. Chapter 2 The Sin of M-O-N-O-T-O-N-Y One Day Ennui was born from uniformity. Mot, our English has changed with the years so that many words now connote more than they did originally. This is true of the word monotonous from having but one tone. It has come to mean more broadly, lack of variation. The monotonous speaker not only drones along in the same volume and pitch of tone but uses always the same emphasis, the same speed, the same thoughts, or dispenses with thought altogether. Monotony, the cardinal and most common sin of the public speaker, is not a transgression, it is rather a sin of omission, for it consists in living up to the confession of the prayer book, we have left undone those things we ought to have done. Emerson says, the virtue of art lies in detachment, in sequestering one object from the embarrassing variety. 
That is just what the monotonous speaker fails to do. He does not detach one thought or phrase from another. They are all expressed in the same manner. To tell you that your speech is monotonous may mean very little to you. So let us look at the nature and the curse of monotony in other spheres of life. Then we shall appreciate more fully how it will blight an otherwise good speech. If the Victrola in the adjoining apartment grinds out just three selections over and over again, it is pretty safe to assume that your neighbor has no other records. If a speaker uses only a few of his powers, it points very plainly to the fact that the rest of his powers are not developed. Monotony reveals our limitations, I and its effect on its victim. Monotony is actually deadly. It will drive the bloom from the cheek and the luster from the eye as quickly as sin, and often leads to viciousness. The worst punishment that human ingenuity has ever been able to invent is extreme monotony, solitary confinement. Lay a marble on the table and do nothing 18 hours of the day but change that marble from one point to another and back again, and you will go insane if you continue long enough. So this thing that shortens life, and is used as the most cruel of punishments in our prisons, is the thing that will destroy all the life and force of a speech. Avoid it as you would shun a deadly dull bore. The idle rich can have half a dozen homes. Command all the varieties of foods gathered from the four corners of the earth, and sail for Africa or Alaska at their pleasure, but the poverty-stricken man must walk or take a street car, he does not have the choice of yacht, auto, or special train. He must spend the most of his life in labor and be content with the staples of the food market. Monotony is poverty, whether in speech or in life. Strive to increase the variety of your speech as the businessman labors to augment his wealth. Bird songs, forest glens, and mountains are not monotonous. It is the long rows of brownstone fronts and the miles of paved streets that are so terribly same. Nature and her wealth gives us endless variety. Man with his limitations is often monotonous. Get back to nature in your methods of speech making. The power of variety lies in its pleasure giving quality. The great truths of the world have often been couched in fascinating stories, Les Miserables, for instance. If you wish to teach or influence men, you must please them, first or last. Strike the same note on the piano over and over again. This will give you some idea of the displeasing, jarring effect monotony has on the ear. The dictionary defines monotonous as being synonymous with wearisome. That is putting it mildly. It is maddening. The department store prince does not discuss the public by playing only the one tune, Come By My Wares. He gives recitals on a $125,000 organ, and the pleased people naturally slip into a buying mood. How to conquer monotony We obviate monotony in dress by replenishing our wardrobes. We avoid monotony in speech by multiplying our powers of speech. We multiply our powers of speech by increasing our tools. The carpenter has special implements with which to construct the several parts of a building. The organist has certain keys and stops which he manipulates to produce his harmonies and effects. In like manner the speaker has certain instruments and tools at his command by which he builds his argument, plays on the feelings, and guides the beliefs of his audience. To give you a conception of these instruments, and practical help in learning to use them, are the purposes of the immediately following chapters, why did not the children of Israel whirl through the desert in limousines, and why did not Noah have moving picture entertainments and talking machines on the ark? The laws that enable us to operate an automobile, produce moving pictures, or music on the Victrola, would have worked just as well then as they do today. It was ignorance of law that for ages deprived humanity of our modern conveniences. Many speakers still use ox cart methods in their speech instead of employing automobile or overland express methods. They are ignorant of laws that make for efficiency in speaking. Just to the extent that you regard and use the laws that we are about to examine and learn how to use will you have efficiency and force in your speaking, and just to the extent that you disregard them will your speaking be feeble and ineffective. We cannot impress too thoroughly upon you the necessity for a real working mastery of these principles. They are the very foundations of successful speaking. Get your principles right, said Napoleon, and the rest is a matter of detail. It is useless to shoe a dead horse, and all the sound principles in Christendom will never make a live speech out of a dead one. So let it be understood that public speaking is not a matter of mastering a few dead rules. The most important law of public speech is the necessity for truth, force, feeling, and life. 
Forget all else, but not this. When you have mastered the mechanics of speech outline in the next few chapters you will no longer be troubled with monotony. The complete knowledge of these principles and the ability to apply them will give you great variety in your powers of expression. But they cannot be mastered and applied by thinking or reading about them, you must practice, practice, practice. If no one else will listen to you, listen to yourself, you must always be your own best critic, and the severest one of all, the technical principles that we lay down in the following chapters are not arbitrary creations of our own. They are all founded on the practices that good speakers and actors adopt, either naturally and unconsciously or under instruction, in getting their effects, IT is useless to warn the student that he must be natural. To be natural may be to be monotonous. The little strawberry up in the arctics with a few tiny seeds and an acid tang is a natural berry, but it is not to be compared with the improved variety that we enjoy here. The dwarfed oak on the rocky hillside is natural, but a poor thing compared with the beautiful tree found in the rich, moist bottom lands. Be natural, but improve your natural gifts until you have approached the ideal, for we must strive after idealized nature, in fruit, tree, and speech. Questions and exercises. Point 1. What are the causes of monotony? 2. Cite some instances in nature. Point 3. Cite instances in man's daily life. Point 4. Describe some of the effects of monotony in both cases. Point 5. Read aloud some speech without paying particular attention to its meaning or force. Point 6. Now repeat it after you have thoroughly assimilated its matter and spirit. What difference do you notice in its rendition? 7. Why is monotony one of the worst as well as one of the most common faults of speakers? Chapter 3 Efficiency through emphasis in S-U-B-O-R-D-I-N-A-T-I-O-N in a word, the principle of emphasis, is followed best, not by remembering particular rules, but by being full of a particular feeling. C.S. Baldwin, writing and speaking, the gun that scatters too much does not bag the birds. The same principle applies to speech. The speaker that fires his force and emphasis at random into a sentence will not get results. Not every word is of special importance, therefore only certain words demand emphasis, you say Massachusetts and Minneapolis, you do not emphasize each syllable alike, but hit the accented syllable with force and hurry over the unimportant ones. Now why do you not apply this principle in speaking a sentence? To some extent you do. In ordinary speech, but do you in public discourse? It is there that monotony caused by lack of emphasis is so painfully apparent. So far as emphasis is concerned, you may consider the average sentence as just one big word, with the important word as the accented syllable. Note the following, destiny is not a matter of chance. It is a matter of choice. You might as well say massa c-h-u-s-e-t-t-s, emphasizing every syllable equally, as to lay equal stress on each word in the foregoing sentences, speak it aloud and see. Of course you will want to emphasize destiny, for it is the principal idea in your declaration, and you will put some emphasis on not, else your hearers may think you are affirming that destiny is a matter of chance. By all means you must emphasize chance, for it is one of the two big ideas in the statement. Another reason why chance takes emphasis is that it is contrasted with choice in the next sentence. Obviously, the author has contrasted these ideas purposely, so that they might be more emphatic, and here we see that contrast is one of the very first devices to gain emphasis. As a public speaker you can assist this emphasis of contrast with your voice. If you say, my horse is not black, what color immediately comes into mind? White, naturally, for that is the opposite of black. If you wish to bring out the thought that destiny is a matter of choice, you can do so more effectively by first saying that destiny is not a matter of chance. Is not the color of the horse impressed upon us more emphatically when you say, my horse is not black. He is white than it would be by hearing you assert merely that your horse is white. In the second sentence of the statement there is only one important word, choice. It is the one word that positively defines the quality of the subject being discussed, and the author of those lines desired to bring it out emphatically, as he has shown by contrasting it with another idea. These lines, then, would read like this, destiny is not a matter of chance. It is a matter of choice. Now read this over. Striking the words in capitals with a great deal of forced I in almost every sentence there are a few mountain peak words that represent the big, important ideas. 
when you pick up the evening paper you can tell at a glance which are the important news articles. Thanks to the editor, he does not tell about a holdup in Hong Kong in the same size type as he uses to report the death of five firemen in your home city. Size of type is his device to show emphasis and bold relief. He brings out sometimes even in red headlines the striking news of the day, IT would be a boon to speechmaking if speakers would conserve the attention of their audiences in the same way and emphasize only the words representing the important ideas. The average speaker will deliver the foregoing line on destiny with about the same amount of emphasis on each word. Instead of saying, it is a matter of choice, he will deliver it, it is a matter of choice, or IT is a matter of choice, both equally bad, Charles Dana the famous editor of the New York Sun, told one of his reporters that if he went up the street and saw a dog bite a man, to pay no attention to it. The Sun could not afford to waste the time and attention of its readers on such unimportant happenings. But, said Mr. Dana, if you see a man bite a dog, hurry back to the office and write the story. Of course that is news, that is unusual, now the speaker who says IT is a matter of choice is putting too much emphasis upon things that are of no more importance to metropolitan readers than a dog bite, and when he fails to emphasize choice he is like the reporter who passes up the man's biting a dog. The ideal speaker makes his big words stand out like mountain peaks, his unimportant words are submerged like stream beds. His big thoughts stand like huge oaks, his ideas of no especial value are merely like the grass around the tree, from all this we may deduce this important principle, emphasis is a matter of contrast and comparison, recently the New York American featured an editorial by Arthur Brisbane. Note the following. Printed in the same type as given here, we do not know what the president thought when he got that message, or what the elephant thinks when he sees the mouse, but we do know what the president did, the words thought and did immediately catch the reader's attention because they are different from the others, not especially because they are larger. If all the rest of the words in this sentence were made ten times as large as they are, and did and thought were kept at their present size, they would still be emphatic, because different, take the following from Robert Chambers' novel, The Business of Life. The words you, had, would, are all emphatic, because they have been made different, he looked at her in angry astonishment. Well, what do you call it if it isn't cowardice, to slink off and marry a defenseless girl like that? Did you expect me to give you a chance to destroy me and poison Jacqueline's mind? If I had been guilty of the thing with which you charge me, what I have done would have been cowardly. Otherwise, it is justified. A Fifth Avenue bus would attract attention up at Menacing Ford, New York, while one of the ox teams that frequently pass there would attract attention on Fifth Avenue. To make a word emphatic, deliver it differently from the manner in which the words surrounding it are delivered. If you have been talking loudly, utter the emphatic word in a concentrated whisper, and you have intense emphasis. If you have been going fast, go very slow on the emphatic word. If you have been talking on a low pitch, jump to a high one on the emphatic word. If you have been talking on a high pitch, take a low one on your emphatic ideas. Read the chapters on inflection, feeling, pause, change of pitch, change of tempo. Each of these will explain in detail how to get emphasis through the use of a certain principled, I end this chapter, however, we are considering only one form of emphasis, that of applying force to the important word and subordinating the unimportant words. Do not forget. This is one of the main methods that you must continually employ in getting your effects, let us not confound loudness with emphasis. To yell is not a sign of earnestness, intelligence, or feeling. The kind of force that we want applied to the emphatic word is not entirely physical. True, the emphatic word may be spoken more loudly, or it may be spoken more softly, but the real quality desired is intensity, earnestness. It must come from within, outward, last night a speaker said, the curse of this country is not a lack of education. It's politics. He emphasized curse, lack, education, politics. The other words were hurried over and thus given no comparative importance at all. The word politics was flamed out with great feeling as he slapped his hands together indignantly. His emphasis was both correct and powerful. He concentrated all our attention on the words that meant something, instead of holding it up on such words as of this, a, of, 
It's, what would you think of a guide who agreed to show New York to a stranger and then took up his time by visiting Chinese laundries and boot blacking parlors on the side streets? There is only one excuse for a speaker's asking the attention of his audience, he must have either truth or entertainment for them. If he wearies their attention with trifles they will have neither vivacity nor desire left when he reaches words of Wall Street and skyscraper importance. You do not dwell on these small words in your everyday conversation, because you are not a conversational bore. Apply the correct method of everyday speech to the platform. As we have noted elsewhere, public speaking is very much like conversation enlarged, sometimes, for big emphasis, it is advisable to lay stress on every single syllable in a word, as absolutely in the following sentence, I absolute ly refuse to grant your demand, now and then this principle should be applied to an emphatic sentence by stressing each word. It is a good device for exciting special attention, and it furnishes a pleasing variety. Patrick Henry's notable climax could be delivered in that manner very effectively, give me liberty or give me death. The italicized part of the following might also be delivered with this every word emphasis. Of course, there are many ways of delivering it, this is only one of several good interpretations that might be chosen, knowing the price we must pay, the sacrifice we must make, the burdens we must carry, the assaults we must endure, knowing full well the cost, yet we enlist, and we enlist for the war. For we know the justice of our cause, and we know, too, its certain triumphed, from past prosperity around, by Albert J. Beveridge, before the Chicago National Convention of the Progressive Party, strongly emphasizing a single word has a tendency to suggest its antithesis. Notice how the meaning changes by merely putting the emphasis on different words in the following sentence. The parenthetical expressions would really not be needed to supplement the emphatic words, I intended to buy a house this spring, even if you did not, I intended to buy a house this spring, but something prevented, I intended to buy a house this spring, instead of renting as heretofore, I intended to buy a house this spring, and not an automobile, I intended to buy a house this spring, instead of next spring, I intended to buy a house this spring, instead of in the autumn, when a great battle is. Reported in the papers, they do not keep emphasizing the same facts over and over again. They try to get new information, or a new slant. The news that takes an important place in the morning edition will be relegated to a small space in the late afternoon edition. We are interested in new ideas and new facts. This principle has a very important bearing in determining your emphasis. Do not emphasize the same idea over and over again unless you desire to lay extra stress on it. Senator Thurston desired to put the maximum amount of emphasis on force in his speech on page 50. Note how force is emphasized repeatedly as a general rule. However, the new idea, the new slant, whether in a newspaper report of a battle or a speaker's enunciation of his ideas, is emphatic to I am the following selection, larger is emphatic, for it is the new idea. All men have eyes, but this man asks for a larger eye, this man with the larger eye says he will discover, not rivers or safety appliances for aeroplanes, but new stars and suns. New stars and suns are hardly as emphatic as the word larger. Why? Because we expect an astronomer to discover heavenly bodies rather than cooking recipes. The words, Republic needs in the next sentence, are emphatic, they introduce a new and important idea. Republics have always needed men, but the author says they need new men. New is emphatic because it introduces a new idea. In like manner, soil, grain, tools, are also emphatic, the most emphatic words are italicized in this selection. Are there any others you would emphasize? Why, the old astronomer said, give me a larger eye, and I will discover new stars and suns. That is what the Republic needs today, new men, men who are wise toward the soil, toward the grains, toward the tools. If God would only raise up for the people two or three men like what, Fulton and McCormick, they would be worth more to the state than that treasure box named California or Mexico and the real supremacy of man is based upon his capacity for education. Man is unique in the length of his childhood, which means the period of plasticity and education. The childhood of a moth, the distance that stands between the hatching of the robin and its maturity, represent a few hours or a few weeks, but twenty years for growth stands between man's cradle and his citizenship. 
this protracted childhood makes it possible to hand over to the boy all the accumulated stores achieved by races and civilizations through thousands of years. Anonymous, you must understand that there are no steel riveted rules of emphasis. It is not always possible to designate which word must and which must not be emphasized. One speaker will put one interpretation on a speech, another speaker will use different emphasis to bring out a different interpretation. No one can say that one interpretation is right and the other wrong. This principle must be borne in mind in all our marked exercises. Here your own intelligence must guide, and greatly to your profit. Questions and exercises 1. What is emphasis? 2. Describe one method of destroying monotony of thought presentation. Point 3. What relation does this have to the use of the voice? 4. Which words should be emphasized, which subordinated, in a sentence? 5. Read the selections on pages 50, 51, 52, 53, and 54, devoting special attention to emphasizing the important words or phrases and subordinating the unimportant ones. Read again, changing emphasis slightly. What is the effect? 6. Read some sentence repeatedly, emphasizing a different word each time, and show how the meaning is changed, as is done on page 22.7. What is the effect of a lack of emphasis? 8. Read the selections on pages 30 and 48, emphasizing every word. What is the effect on the emphasis? 9. When is it permissible to emphasize every single word in a sentence? 10. Note the emphasis and subordination in some conversation or speech you have heard. Were they well made? Why? Can you suggest any improvement? 11. From a newspaper or a magazine, clip a report of an address or a biographical eulogy. Mark the passage for emphasis and bring it with you to class point 12. In the following passage, would you make any changes in the author's markings for emphasis? Where? Why? Bear in mind that not all words marked require the same degree of emphasis, in a wide variety of emphasis, and in nice shading of the gradations, lie the excellence of emphatic speech. I would call him Napoleon, but Napoleon made his way to empire over broken oaths and threw a sea off blood. This man never broke his word. No retaliation was his great motto and the rule of his life, and the last words uttered to his son in France were these. My boy, you will one day go back to Santo Domingo, forget that France murdered your father. I would call him Cromwell, but Cromwell was only a soldier, and the state he founded went down with him into his grave. I would call him Washington, but the great Virginian held slaves. This man risked his empire rather than permit the slave trade in the humblest village of his dominions. You think me a fanatic tonight, for you read history, not with your eyes, but with your prejudices. But fifty years hence, when truth gets a hearing, the muse of history will put Phocian for the Greek, and Brutus for the Roman, Hampton for England, Lafayette for France, choose Washington as the bright, consummate flower of our earlier civilization, and John Brown the ripe fruit of our noonday, then, dipping her pen in the sunlight, will write in the clear blue, above them all, the name of the soldier, the statesman, the martyr, Toussaint Louverture, Wendell Phillips, Toussaint. Louverture, practice on the following selections for emphasis, Beecher's Abraham Lincoln, page 76, Lincoln's Gettysburg speech, page 50, Seward's Irrepressible Conflict, page 67, and Brian's Prince of Peace, page 448. Chapter 4 Efficiency through change of PITCH speech is simply a modified form of singing, the principal difference being in the fact that in singing the vowel sounds are prolonged and the intervals are short whereas in speech the words are uttered in what may be called staccato tones, the vowels not being specially prolonged and the intervals between the words being more distinct. The fact that in singing we have a larger range of tones does not properly distinguish it from ordinary speech. In speech we have likewise a variation of tones, and even in ordinary conversation there is a difference of from three to six semitones, as I have found in my investigations, and in some persons the range is as high as one octave, William Skepagrell, Popular Science Monthly. By pitch, as everyone knows, we mean the relative position of a vocal tone, as high, medium, low, or any variation between. In public speech we apply it not only to a single utterance, as an exclamation or a monosyllable, oh, or the, 
but to any group of syllables, words, and even sentences that may be spoken in a single tone. This distinction it is important to keep in mind, for the efficient speaker not only changes the pitch of successive syllables, see chapter 7, efficiency through inflection, but gives a different pitch to different parts, or word groups, of successive sentences. It is this phase of the subject which we are considering in this chapter. Every change in the thought demands a change in the voice pitch whether the speaker follows the rule consciously, unconsciously, or subconsciously. This is the logical basis upon which all good voice variation is made, yet this law is violated more often than any other by public speakers. A criminal may disregard a law of the state without detection and punishment, but the speaker who violates this regulation suffers its penalty at once in his loss of effectiveness, while his innocent hearers must endure the monotony, for monotony is not only a sin of the perpetrator, as we have shown, but a plague on the victims as well, change of pitch is a stumbling block for almost all beginners, and for many experienced speakers also. This is especially true when the words of the speech have been memorized. If you wish to hear how pitch monotony sounds, strike the same note on the piano over and over again. You have in your speaking voice a range of pitch from high to low, with a great many shades between the extremes. With all these notes available there is no excuse for offending the ears and taste of your audience by continually using the one note. True, the reiteration of the same tone in music, as in pedal point on an organ composition, may be made the foundation of beauty, for the harmony weaving about that one basic tone produces a consistent, insistent quality not felt in pure variety of chord sequences. In like manner the intoning voice in a ritual may, though it rarely does, possess a solemn beauty. But the public speaker should shun the monotone as he would a pestilence. Continual change of pitch is nature's highest method in our search for the principles of efficiency we must continually go back to nature. Listen, really listen, to the birds sing. Which of these feathered tribes are most pleasing in their vocal efforts? Those whose voices, though sweet, have little or no range, or those that, like the canary, the lark, and the nightingale, not only possess a considerable range but utter their notes in continual variety of combinations? Even a sweet tone chirp, when reiterated without change, may grow maddening to the enforced listener, the little child seldom speaks in a monotonous pitch. Observe the conversations of little folk that you hear on the street or in the home, and note the continual changes of pitch. The unconscious speech of most adults is likewise full of pleasing variations. Imagine someone speaking the following, and consider if the effect would not be just about as indicated. Remember, we are not now discussing the inflection of single words, but the general pitch in which phrases are spoken, high pitch, I'd like to leave for my vacation tomorrow, lower, still, I have so much to do. Higher, yet I suppose if I wait until I have time I'll never go. Repeat this, first in the pitches indicated, and then all in the one pitch, as many speakers would. Observe the difference in naturalness of effect, the following exercise should be spoken in a purely conversational tone, with numerous changes of pitch. Practice it until your delivery would cause a stranger in the next room to think you were discussing an actual incident with a friend, instead of delivering a memorized monologue. If you are in doubt about the effect you have secured, repeat it to a friend and ask him if it sounds like memorized words. If it does, it is wrong doubt a similar CASE jack. I hear you've gone and done it. Yes, I know, most fellows will, went and tried it once myself, sir, though you see I'm single still. And you met her, did you tell me, down at Newport, last July, and resolved to ask the question at a soiree? So did I, I suppose you left the ballroom, with its music and its light, for they say love's flame is brightest in the darkness of the night. Well, you walked along together, overhead the starlit sky. And I'll bet, old man, confess it, you were frightened. So was I. So you strolled along the terrace, saw the summer moonlight pour all its radiance on the waters, as they rippled on the shore, till at length you gathered courage, when you saw that none was nigh, did you draw her close and tell her that you loved her? So did I doubt well, I needn't ask you further, and I'm sure I wish you joy. Think I'll wander down and see you when you're married, eh, my boy? When the honeymoon is over and you're settled down, we'll try, what? The deuce you say. Rejected, you rejected. So was I dot, anonymous, the necessity for changing pitch is so self-evident that it should be grasped and applied immediately. 
However, it requires patient drill to free yourself from monotony of pitched, in natural conversation you think of an idea first, and then find words to express it. In memorized speeches you are liable to speak the words, and then think what they mean, and many speakers seem to trouble very little even about that. Is it any wonder that reversing the process should reverse the result? Get back to nature in your methods of expression, read the following selection in a nonchalant manner, never pausing to think what the words really mean. Try it again, carefully studying the thought you have assimilated. Believe the idea, desire to express it effectively, and imagine an audience before you. Look them earnestly in the face and repeat this truth. If you follow directions, you will note that you have made many changes of pitch after several readings. IT is not work that kills men, it is worry. Work is healthy, you can hardly put more upon a man than he can bear. Worry is rust upon the blade. It is not the revolution that destroys the machinery but the friction. Henry Ward Beecher, change of pitch produces emphasis This is a highly important statement. Variety in pitch maintains the hearer's interest, but one of the surest ways to compel attention, to secure unusual emphasis, is to change the pitch of your voice suddenly and in a marked degree. A great contrast always arouses attention. White shows whiter against black. A cannon roars louder in the Sahara silence than in the Chicago hurly-burly, these are simple illustrations of the power of contrast. What is Congress going to do next, high pitch, I do not know. Low pitch, by such sudden change of pitch during a sermon Dr. Newell Dwight Hillis recently achieved great emphasis and suggested the gravity of the question he had raised, the foregoing order of pitch change might be reversed with equally good effect, though with a slight change in seriousness either method produces emphasis when used intelligently, that is, with a common sense appreciation of the sort of emphasis to be attained, I in attempting these contrasts of pitch it is important to avoid unpleasant extremes. Most speakers pitch their voices too high. One of the secrets of Mr. Bryan's eloquence is his low, bell-like voice. Shakespeare said that a soft, gentle, low voice was an excellent thing in woman, it is no less so in man, for a voice need not be blatant to be powerful, and must not be, to be pleasing, I in closing, let us emphasize anew the importance of using variety of pitch. You sing up and down the scale, first touching one note and then another above or below it. Do likewise in speaking, thought and individual taste must generally be your guide as to where to use a low, a moderate, or a high pitch. Questions and exercises 1. Name two methods of destroying monotony and gaining force in speaking. Point 2. Why is a continual change of pitch necessary in speaking? 3. Notice your habitual tones in speaking. Are they too high to be pleasant? 4. Do we express the following thoughts and emotions in a low or a high pitch? which may be expressed in either high or low pitch. Excitement. Victory. Defeat. Sorrow. Love. Earnestness. Fear.5. How would you naturally vary the pitch in introducing an explanatory or parenthetical expression like the following, he started, that is, he made preparations to start, on September 3.6. Speak the following lines with as marked variations in pitch as your interpretation of the sense may dictate. Try each line in two different ways. Which, in each instance, is the more effective, and why, what have I to gain from you? Nothing. To engage our nation in such a compact would be an infamy, note, in the foregoing sentence, experiment as to where the change in pitch would better be made, once the flowers distilled their fragrance here. But now see the devastations of Ward, he had reckoned without one prime factor, his conscience. Point seven. Make a diagram of a conversation you have heard, showing where high and low pitches were used. Were these changes in pitch advisable? Why or why not? 8. Read the selections on pages 34, 35, 36, 37, and 38, paying careful attention to the changes in pitch. Reread, substituting low pitch for high, and vice versa, selections for practice note, in the following selections, those passages that may best be delivered in a moderate pitch are printed in ordinary, Roman, type. Those which may be rendered in a high pitch, do not make the mistake of raising the voice too high, are printed in italics. Those which might well be spoken in a low pitch are printed in capitals, these arrangements, however, are merely suggestive, 
we cannot make it strong enough that you must use your own judgment in interpreting a selection. Before doing so, however, it is well to practice these passages as they are marked, yes, all men labor. Rufus Choate and Daniel Webster labor, say the critics. But every man who reads of the labor question knows that it means the movement of the men that earn their living with their hands, that are employed, and paid wages, are gathered under roofs of factories, sent out on farms, sent out on ships, gathered on the walls. In popular acceptation, the working class means the men that work with their hands, for wages, so many hours a day, employed by great capitalists, that work for everybody else. Why do we move for this class? Why, asks a critic, don't you move for all working men? Because, while Daniel Webster gets $40,000 for arguing the Mexican claims, there is no need of anybody's moving for him. Because, while Rufus Choate gets $5,000 for making one argument to a jury, there is no need of moving for him, or for the men that work with their brains, that do highly disciplined and skilled labor, invent, and write books. The reason why the labor movement confines itself to a single class is because that class of work does not get paid, does not get protection. Mental labor is adequately paid, and more than adequately protected. It can shift ITS channels, it can vary according to the supply and demand. If a man fails as a minister, why, he becomes a railway conductor. If that doesn't suit him, he goes west, and becomes governor of a territory. And if he finds himself incapable of either of these positions, he comes home, and gets to be a city editor. He varies his occupation as he pleases, and doesn't need protection. But the great mass, chained to a trade, doomed to be ground up in the mill of supply and demand, that works so many hours a day, and must run in the great ruts of business, they are the men whose inadequate protection, whose unfair share of the general product, claims a movement in their behalf. Wendell Phillips. Knowing the price we must pay, the sacrifice we must make, the burdens we must carry, the assaults we must endure, knowing full well the cost, yet we enlist, and we enlist for the war. For we know the justice of our cause, and we know, too, its certain triumph. Not reluctantly then, but eagerly, not with faint hearts but strong, do we now advance upon the enemies of the people. For the call that comes to us is the call that came to our fathers. As they responded so shall we. He hath sounded forth a trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. O H, be swift our souls to answer him, be jubilant our feet, our God is marching on. Albert J. Beveridge, remember that two sentences, or two parts of the same sentence, which contain changes of thought, cannot possibly be given effectively in the same key. Let us repeat. Every big change of thought requires a big change of pitch. What the beginning student will think are big changes of pitch will be monotonously alike. Learn to speak some thoughts in a very high tone, others in a very, very low tone. Develop range. It is almost impossible to use too much of it. That happy am I that this mission has brought my feet at last to press New England's historic soil and my eyes to the knowledge of her beauty and her thrift. Here within touch of Plymouth Rock and Bunker Hill, where Webster thundered and Longfellow sang, Emerson thought and Channing preached, here in the cradle of American letters and almost of American liberty, I hasten to make the obeisance that every American owes New England when first he stands uncovered in her mighty presence. Strange Apparition This stern and unique figure, carved from the ocean and the wilderness, its majesty kindling and growing amid the storms of winter and of wars, until at last the gloom was broken, ITS beauty disclosed in the sunshine, and the heroic workers rested at its base, while startled kings and emperors gazed and marveled that from the rude touch of this handful cast on a bleak and unknown shore should have come the embodied genius of human government and the perfected model of human liberty. God bless the memory of those immortal workers, and prosper the fortunes of their living sons, and perpetuate the inspiration of their handiwork. Far to the south, Mr. President, separated from this section by a line, once defined an irrepressible difference, once traced in fratricidal blood, and now, thank God, but a vanishing shadow, lies the fairest and richest domain of this earth. It is the home of a brave and hospitable people. There is centered all that can please or prosper humankind. 
a perfect climate above a fertile soil yields to the husbandman every product of the temperate zone. There, by night the cotton whitens beneath the stars, and by day the wheat locks the sunshine in ITS bearded sheaf. In the same field the clover steals the fragrance of the wind, and tobacco catches the quick aroma of the rains. There are mountains stored with exhaustless treasures, forests, vast and primeval, and rivers that, tumbling or loitering, run wanton to the sea. Of the three essential items of all industries, cotton, iron and wood, that region has easy control. In cotton, a fixed monopoly, in iron, proven supremacy, in timber, the reserve supply of the republic. From this assured and permanent advantage, against which artificial conditions cannot much longer prevail, has grown an amazing system of industries. Not maintained by human contrivance of tariff or capital.